and uh, all right. So, welcome everybody. Let me go. Uh, I assume you guys can hear the sound of my voice. If so, please raise your hand. Yes, there we go. People are raising their hands. Thank you, Saul. At least one person raised their hands. So that makes me feel better. And uh, all right, I've got more people that are going to be showing up, I'm assuming. But I want to welcome everybody. Today we have a special guest with CalPro Inspection Group, Charles Skinner. And I hope you've been saving all of your questions about inspection reports and how to read them and what do they mean, because he's going to answer all those questions. Isn't that right? It's yes, like yes, absolutely. <laughs> all right. So um, why don't you try showing your screen, Charles? Okay. You got to do that. There's a little button that says, it looks like a um, a monitor and you have to click on that button. So there's a microphone, a camera, and then another one that's a monitor. You need to click on that. And you should be able to show. Uh, I don't. All right. Go ahead and take it away. Okay, so um, one of the first things that I wanted to mention, um, very important, um, I know that uh, a lot of times um, when we do these inspections, um, you know, on all different home inspection companies, when we do these inspections, um, most people concentrate on the summary section. Um, summary section is typically going to have the more important items, the items that are going to be a little bit more costly, and the items that are going to be um, safety items. So um one of the things that i always like to encourage um, our clients to do is read through the entire inspection um we may have some items in the inspection that are not as big of a deal um maybe they're just they're items that, are, that can be taken care of later but they're still concerning to some and then those items should still be looked at so um as with um you know most home inspections there's going to be a summary section and most items are going to be um, color coded so our summary section basically just states, again, it states the items that are, um, you know, more serious, um, more expensive, safety items, electrical problems, water leaks, things like that. And then um, I'll scroll down here and I'll pass by those items and I'll go right here. This is, this is the way that our report is broken down. Um, okay would be items that are serviceable or functional. No, no issues noted. Those will be the first checkbox. And then our black bolt items, those are like marginal maintenance items things that can be looked into at a later date. And we also mentioned um, sometimes items just um, for a special note, for example, um, any light bulbs that might not be functional, things like that. And then also um, the red, the, the RR repair or replace items, those are the more serious items. And those are the things that um, should be, you know, um, every report has its different type of color coding. You know, some people have blue or green or red or purple. But um, obviously, the best thing to do is to familiarize yourself with the report and um, the way that everything's color coded first, so that way you know, you know, what to look for in the very beginning. So um, back to our summary, um, this one basically just tells you, um, you know, gives you more information about the, the property, and then um, and we basically just break it down into any items that are that are would be considered red bold or, or safety or or our higher dollar, dollar volume value items see like in this picture you can see that there's um, several slip roof tiles um, there's a little bit of deterioration to some of the wood members um, on the garage door um, obviously you know anything roof related for us uh, for the most part if, if there's any openings which would allow water and those would be considered um, you know um, uh, areas that can be damaging to the home um, same thing here you can see there's some dry rot here um, to the roof members um double taps electrical problems those are always going to be safety concerns and so those will be noted as red items as well this is a problem with the interior of the fireplace um, that can cause 
um, concerns with the fireplace itself um, and, and fire fire safety issues. So those those will always always be noted there as well. Um, um, special concerns here again. Um, these are these are items with um, the condensate line um, with um, with the air conditioning and heating system in the attic space. Um, this is a void to the firewall on the on the um, this the service door to the garage, which uh, goes from the garage to the to the house. Um, and honestly, this is the other thing. A lot of people's inspection reports um, they're really basic. They just have um, check marks and, and notes and information. Um, our our particular type of report is pretty detailed. It has every single section. Um, there's actually a table of contents at the very beginning. Can you see? Can you still see my screen? Okay. Yes, you can make it a little bigger, maybe. Like zoom in. There we okay. go. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So um, then we pretty much just break into all the different um, sections. So, for example, grounds. Has information about um, anything that that has to do with the exterior of the home, um, you know, as far as um, everything surrounding the actual envelope of the house. So um, obviously the paving conditions, um, fencing, irrigation, all of those items, those are all listed in here. Fencing, you can see there's some um, leaning fencing here. The irrigation. And the thing that um, we do in our inspections also is we do a lot of reference pictures, even if there aren't actually um, problems with an area, we will also take pictures just so that you can see the areas um, as well. Um, so that you have an idea. And then our, the next section in our report moves into exterior. And then with this, we're talking about anything um, having to do with the exterior of the home, including the chimney, um, any of the wall surfaces on the exterior, um, any of the electrical on, this, on, the, on the wall uh, on the exterior, the doors, And so, for example, um, just so that you have more of a specific idea, our reports are, are, are basically set up this way. The very first thing that you see is, you know, um, where the area is, you know, the concerns with the area, and then um, it lets you know about um, the operation, the main operation of the door, um, the, the concern, the main operation of the area, and then it also has any items that are considered marginal or maintenance. And so, for example, um, looking at this here, you can see that the screen door material is damaged. That's not a safety risk. That's not something that's going to be really costly. Um, and so we note that as a marginal maintenance item. Um, honestly, it could be probably left that way. Um, you can still use it. But in like a, in a situation like this, for example, this uh, side um, entry door here where there's uh, dry rot um, deterioration down here to the wood members, what's going to happen with dry rot is Dry rot's going to continue, uh, the fungus itself is actually going to continue to grow and it's going to eventually damage the entire door frame. So that's the reason why we call any dry rot out um, as a red bolt item. Windows, chimney, we also talked about the foundation here at the exterior view. Um, typically in this next section, we would also have um, a crawl space or basement section. Um, but this home was built on a slab foundation, so there isn't any areas there. But in our next section, we would have that right before the roof. You can see here where there's slip tiles. You zoom in on this a little bit. And I can go into any of these items. I mean, I know this isn't specifically what um, what I what I will be talking about, but I can answer any questions specifically about some of these areas as well, like why it's important to repair slip tiles and things of that nature. I don't know how specific you guys want to go into some of this, but and as you can see here, we also include maintenance recommendations as well. So there's a question. Do you do sewer lateral and sidewalk inspections, you know, for maintenance? 
Um, so we don't do sidewalk inspections. We do um, we do sewer lateral inspections, and I can actually show you a sample report of that as well. Um, so the sewer lateral inspections that we do, um, we in the home inspection report, we don't actually specifically cover anything having to do with the sewer lateral. We only cover any of the piping that that's accessible to us. Um, if it was a crawl space, obviously we would do um, we would do um, uh, we would make notes of that inside the report itself if it's accessible if there's any kind of leaks or any kind of damage that's visible um but uh on a slab home there's really no way for us to know that but that's the nice thing about having um the sewer lateral is that in most cases not only will we do the sewer lateral which is the piping from the home to the city's connection if it's possible we will also run the camera backwards into the home and uh, see if we can see anything to the piping that's underneath the house as well cool So in this case, for example, this particular home um, did not have a solar inspection done, but we do actually do inspections that are separate, um, standalone um, uh, of the solar system if it's if it's um, needed as well. But in our normal home inspection, it's not something that's in the, within the scope of our inspection. When we look at electrical panels, we'll open up the electrical panel and look for any kind of items like this where there's a Two wires underneath one um, lugged on a on a breaker that's um, that's not um, that's not um, proper for any kind of installation. You should only have one wire. If we see um, any evidence of any kind of arcing, um, any issues with the electrical panel on the inside, improper wiring, all that kind of stuff, most of those items will be covered in our normal inspection. All of our um, outlets and fixtures, and so just so that it's it's very it's, so that it's very clear when we do our home inspections, our home inspections are visual inspections based on the on the areas that are accessible during the home inspection. Um, we're not going to attempt to diagnose anything. We're going to test everything as it would normally operate, and then we will view everything that is fully accessible. So, for example, if there are couches, tables, rugs, all of those things. We do not attempt to move any seller's items or any stored items in the home. Um, it, the main thing though, is when we go underneath sinks, sinks are a little bit different. We'll move a few things if we can get to it, but if it's just packed full of items, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard for us to, um, to get to, to some of those areas. And a lot of times sellers will get really upset if we start to move all their stuff around. So um, we will do um, the absolute best inspection that we can possibly do based on what we have accessible to us. Um, obviously, if there's someone home, we will always ask if they can move items. Um, but definitely, if if there's if there's a couch or tables or even um, window coverings that are preventing us from viewing a window, we will do our inspection from the outside if we can. But we won't be able to operate the window. Um, again, you have a lot of um, homeowners that get really upset when you lean on their on their equipment and on the, on their items. And so we do our best um, that we absolutely can, um, as long as there aren't items in the way. Um, same thing with attic accesses. You know, if we can't get into um, crawl spaces under homes or attic access because of stored items, um, a lot of times people have a lot of stored items in their closets, which prevent us from actually gaining access to their crawl space under the home or their attic space above. So before, if you're doing a pre-listing or even if you're doing a buyer's transaction, it's very important that you coordinate with either the seller's agent or with your sellers to make sure that these items are, are removed so that we can do a proper inspection. And obviously anything that's accessible, especially if it's a pre-listing inspection and there's things that they wanna know about ahead of time, it's always important to make sure that these items are moved or uh, we have access to those areas, uh, electrical panels especially. Uh, sometimes uh, what we run into is you'll have um, clients that will lock their electrical panels and then we're at a buyer's transaction and you know we're trying to you know get into the electrical panel do the inspection um, or a sub panel in the garage, it's got uh, store items in front of it. Those items we can't inspect if they're locked. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot, a, a lot of time, um, you know, to get the the seller to agree to let us cut the lock or open the lock or whatever the case may be. So um, before we do these inspections, it's always important to find out about all of these things. We will not turn water back on a supply to a home, and there's a reason for that. The reason being is if the water is shut off for a reason, maybe because there's a leak or because there's something else that's going on. If we turn on the water, then obviously then we are going to cause damage to the home. And so all of these things need to be um, um, figured out before we come to do the inspection. Whoever it is, regardless of what company it is, most companies will not do that because it's a huge liability to turn on water, to turn on gas, to turn on electrical. 
because there's usually a reason for those things being turned off. And so for us or any company to come in and do an inspection, all of these things need to be prepared for ahead of time. Same thing if a gas, if, if a house has been vacant for a while and electric has been turned off or gas has been turned off, all of those things should be taken care of before we come to do an inspection. So that way we can provide the, the best inspection possible. And then to also avoid revisits, which are also costly because then there's usually a reinspection fee for those situations. Um, when we take when we test um, air conditioning and heating systems, again, we will test the unit uh, for normal operation. We're going to operate the unit from the thermostat. Um, we'll check temperature outputs from the heater um, and also from the air conditioner. Um, we'll check uh, temperature differential between the supply and the return. Um, and as long as it's somewhere between um, 18 and 20 degrees, that's considered normal. Um, and again, we operate the equipment on the day of, and that is that is the did I just close that? I think I did. Yeah. Uh, let's go back. Um, we we test the equipment, and the equipment is based upon the operation that day. So you know we will do our best to identify problems that may become a problem in the future, but it's not always possible to know. I mean, we'll go in and do an inspection on a water heater that was perfectly functional on the day that we were there. It's an older unit. And then it says, um, you know, it's it's maybe 10, 15 years old. It works fine. It has great temperature output, and then it fails or starts to leak, you know, within a week or two after we're there. So one of the other things that we mentioned. So for example, if we mentioned in the inspection report that this item, and you see, we we actually have a um, an age range that we typically say what what the lifespan of a natural gas furnace is in this case. Um, if the furnace is 18 years old we start to put in into our inspections at about 20 years we'll mention that this unit's older and you should uh, budget for to, for replacement of a new unit here's the thing as the representative for these buyers and these sellers you have to know that if this unit is older if you're talking if you're dealing with a buyer this is these are things that you should be able to tell them without even having us mention it so obviously if the unit's this old it's getting towards the end of its life we don't want to give the um the impression that something that's this old is going to last many, many years longer because most likely it's not going to. Um, but we we write it up in our reports in a, in a way to basically explain that, hey, this is operational now, but um, it's at the age where it could fail at any time. And so it should be it should be written. Now, we write it in such a way to, to make it not sound alarming, but it's the reality of things. You know, this kind of thing does definitely happen all the time. And it's, and it's definitely important to keep that in mind when you're when you're um, again at a buyer's transaction and the, and the unit's pretty old. It's best to educate your client to let them know that that there's that the unit um, is older and it could fail. Um, anything that's 10 years and older on a water heater, we'll mention the same thing. Um, on an air conditioner, anything that's 16 and, and older, we'll mention that the same thing in there as well as far as the age. I see there's some chat messages on here today. Were there any other questions that have come through? I think I've been keeping you up. Somebody, there's a request for a price list, so I've reached out to Kelsey, um, okay. and I'll provide that to people. Yeah, I mean, I can, and I can go real specific into some of this stuff. So, for example, HVAC. I mean, HVAC. There's a lot of things. Even if we mention them as a marginal maintenance item, or we mention them as a um as an item even if it says if it's not red or if it's not considered as a health or safety item that's why it's important to read through everything because there might be something that's for example this condensate pan um in the attic for this unit here this condensate pan if there's any evidence of water leaking into that pan or any kind of rusting or anything like that it's very important to have that evaluated because what will happen eventually is after that water can condensate continuously drips into that pan it's going to rust it all the way through and then it's going to start causing water damage and so even if it's a plastic can, um, it can still cause water damage by overflowing. So even if there's notes in here, if it if there's a note in there about mentioning to to have further evaluation made, that those those recommendations need to be need to be considered. Um, um, it, they need to be considered because it's it, even if it's not a current problem now, um, it's something that should be looked into so that a larger problem doesn't occur in the future. And so. That's why I mentioned when I say to make sure to read the entire inspection report, those those um, recommendations are very important because there are definitely items throughout um, that should be heated uh, uh, throughout. 
of the inspection. Yeah, I want to talk about plumbing systems. So, um, so there's there's uh, several different types of piping. Um, you know, when it comes to when it comes to older houses, um, older houses will have typically, um, and by older I mean you know built in the 60s, um, and some also into the 70s. But anything before that is most likely going to have this. Um, an older home will have um, cast iron supply lines and will usually have cast iron or galvanized, uh, I'm sorry, galvanized supply lines and cast iron and galvanized um, drain lines. Um, the important thing to know about galvanized supply lines is um, galvanized supply lines are almost like um, a, a clogged artery, like a clogged artery in your, in your body. Um, you know, if it, over time, th there's a buildup that will start to, to build up on the inside of that pipe, and it's literally like a clogged artery. It'll actually start to diminish the flow of the water and then the other problem that occurs is that anytime there's any abrupt movement in the water, so for example, if you shut the water off, turn it back on, and the water comes rushing back through that pipe again, some of that sediment will break off, and then it'll actually um, come out in the flow of water. And so if you have aerators and small screens on some of your devices, like a lot of washers do, um, faucets will also have these, it'll clog those, those uh, aerators and prevent the water from flowing properly. Um, so it's important to, to note that on these homes, it's, it's something that's, that's, it's a common occurrence and it's something that the homeowner needs to understand when they're getting into a home that's older, this is the kind of thing that can happen every single time they shut their water off or anytime there's any movement or change in the water. Um, and then um, there's all kinds of other different um, concerns with different types of piping. Um, most homes that are built anywhere after that, around 70 up until about 2000, will have um, primarily copper piping. Um, which is pretty tried and true. Copper piping is is, is um, it's a it's a very good um, supply line um, type of piping. But a lot of times um, nowadays, most homes that are built anywhere after 2000 are using what's called PEX. Um, it's a plastic line. There have been some litigations and some other problems with PEX piping, and so you'll notice that you know sometimes we'll we'll look for the type of piping so we can verify the brand because specific brands have specific problems, and so we'll mention that. Um, most homes, anything built somewhere around 1970-ish, 1975-ish, have started to use ABS plastic um, drain lines. That is pretty much the standard for all drain lines nowadays, and you should see that in most homes. It's the black plastic piping, um, that's what you'll pretty much see um, most times. And then also um, water pressure at the home. Um, again, this is something that needs to be specifically um, heated if we mention this. If the pressure is above 80 pounds, it can cause damage to um, to water lines, um, damage to um, faucets and other components in the home, uh, plumbing components in the home. And so, um, if the water pressure is high, it should definitely be lowered either by means of a um, water pressure regulator or um, um, some deal, dealing with the with the water supply company to see if your pressure can be lowered. And then we're kind of getting into the area of of, of drainage. So um, again. Um, if a home has a sewer, oh, and this is important to note as well, if you want to get a sewer lateral inspection done, um, there's there's multiple ways to, to do a sewer, an inspection on a sewer lateral line, uh, ways to gain access. Um, the first one would be a clean out. Um, the main sewer clean out at the front of a home, usually, or the back of a home or the side of a home, those are usually going to be at ground level. They'll usually be about three or four inches in diameter, and there'll be a cap like what's on this one here in the middle. Um, that's the, the quickest and easiest way to access a sewer lateral. Um, some older homes which do not have cleanouts, we will then need to gain access from a large vent stack on the roof. Um, and so when a, when a, a company come, it tells you to, to do a sewer lateral inspection, they'll tell you that they have to get on the roof. That, that's another uh, option. Sometimes that's the, that's the method that's needed to gain access to the lateral. Um, also, if there is no clean out accessible or maybe it's hidden um, and then there's no large vent stack that's available, um, then sometimes we can gain access from a, um, a, a clean out on the side of the house, maybe by the kitchen, maybe by a bathroom, something of that nature. Um, but uh, besides that, usually the only other way to gain access is to pull a toilet, um, which our company um, does not do just because of the, the fact that you have to reinstall the toilet when you're done. Um, and again, that brings in liability because of having to reinstall the toilet and breaking it and leaks and all, and all that other kind of stuff. So um, typically a plumber would um, would do it, but that's 
a lot more rare to have to, to gain access that way. But the importance of a sewer lateral inspection is actually, um, it, it can definitely be key in some situations. Um, most cases, especially if the house is at least 20 years older, uh, 20 years or older, um, it's, it's definitely a good idea to perform a sewer lateral inspection. I feel like most people do not get them done, um, but they don't realize the severity of, of what can be underground on some of these pipes. Even if the home is a newer home and it's, and it's plumbed with ABS or PVC drain lines to the exterior, um, what can end up happening is just you can have bellies or low spots, which will cause um, blockage. And then with PVC lines, especially, if there's a root that's growing near that, that area, it can actually deform the pipe and cause blockage. Even if it's not old enough to create root intrusion, it can definitely still um, cause a problem with um, obstruction. So um, the only way to know that is to, is to run the camera. And the thing about it is, is without knowing that, obviously, um, the cost to repair some of these lines especially if you have to dig through the driveway or any kind of concrete areas, the cost goes up exponentially because of how much work is needed. And a lot of these sewer lines are pretty deep. And so um, the cost for a plumber to come in and dig these lines out can be very costly. And I mean, we're talking anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand to several thousand dollars um, just to repair one sewer line problem. The next part, portion of our report is um, dealing with the kitchen area, um, and this is talking about any uh, areas under the sinks, operation of the um, appliances, um, and uh, ventilation and dishwasher and all that, and that's all, all in here. And again, a lot of these items are, are marginal maintenance items, but they're items that are definitely usually deferred maintenance and we should be looked at. We have a question as to what ABS stands for. Oh, you stumped me there. I'm going to have to look that up. Well, um, let's see. I can do that. How about this? What uh, common appliance systems do you see that are common with trouble? Um, well, I know why we neither of us do that. It's acrolimnitrite butadiene styrene. Yeah, and then uh, PV. PVC, same thing. It's uh, poly polyvinyl chloride. Right. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste the the chemical formula into the chat for yeah. Uh, yeah that's that's uh, and but, uh, same thing. Uh, PEX PEX is actually an acronym uh, as well. It's a it's a type of pipe. And so same as PVC, it's P E X. That's actually an acronym for for and it's the same thing. It's a it's a it's a super uh, difficult to read with a type of formula of <laughs> what kind of piping it is, but it's very similar. Um, it's 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 that's the reason why they call it what they call it because it's a lot easier to talk about <laughs> yeah. than, than mentioning it that way. Um, as far as appliances, um, very very often. Let's just start from the top, okay? Ranges. Um, ranges are very often um, not secured properly. Um, so uh, any anybody that um, that that has a new um, range or oven installed um, freestanding, it should have an anti-tip device installed um, on the back to keep it from tipping over. If small children were to open it up and step on the door to to try to get, you know climb up and, and get onto something, so the anti-tip device basically it goes over the back um, foot of the of the range to keep it from tipping over. Um, very often um, that's a problem. Um, burners that aren't cleaned. Um, that uh, when you turn them down, they either they don't ignite properly or when you turn them all the way to low, they actually just go out. And then at that point, you just have gas that's just flowing. So let's say you're trying to simmer something and you, and you have it on the oven and you're cooking it and you got it on low. Well, if the, if the flame goes out, that's one of the things that we look for in our inspection because it can be a safety risk. And that's a red item on our reports because if that flame goes out, obviously you just have gas that's escaping. So that can be a problem. Um, let's see, uh, ventilation, um, grease screens that are, that are just dirty. Um, you know, light bulbs that are out, uh, core operating fans, um, things of that nature. Typically, grease screens are dirty because most people just don't clean them. Um, microwaves, we test those for operation. Um, most of the time for those, it's just, uh, you know, the part, part, part of the, the, the ventilation, uh, the grease screen's dirty, or maybe the light bulbs don't work, or maybe the turntable doesn't function. Um, dishwashers, most of the time, it's just, 
damages on the inside just from age. You know, the, the, the drawers will be rusted, the, the, the racks will be rusted. Um, maybe the detergent tray doesn't open up properly. Maybe the door springs are bad, so it just falls open. One of the biggest things that we find with uh, dishwashers, though, is uh, clogged uh, drain lines, um, which will then discharge water from the air gap device. Um, most people that, that I've ran into, they think that it's normal for water to actually come out of that device that's on top of the sink. Um, and it's totally not. And you're never supposed to have water discharging from that. And then what that ends up being a problem is, is that water will then leak down into the base of the, of the sink and then cause uh, damage. And again, all of these things are occurring. People have all kinds of stuff in the bottom of their sinks and then they won't even know that there's actually a problem. And so um, it's very, very important to do your own type of inspection as, as homeowners and, and um, you know, uh, to make sure that there's no uh, active leaking going on because, you know, it's crazy how many things that we find that homeowners didn't even know about. You know, like even, even something that's as severe as a leak underneath the sink where they're staining and, and warping to the base. I mean, they would have never known because they have so many items down there and they just open it up real quick, grab what they need, and then they go about their business. But it's always important to look for those things. Um, this is one of the biggest things we find. And most of the time it's because a garbage disposal is pretty simple to install by a homeowner. But um, this is actually a pretty um, uh, severe item. And actually, we, we actually write this up as a red bolt item now. This report's a little bit older. But we write this up as a, up as a red bolt item because um, you notice on the bottom of this, there's nothing holding that wire in the bottom of the garbage disposal. And so um, what we recommend to install is a strain relief or a grommet um, type plug. Um, when you buy the garbage disposal, it doesn't come with that. It just has, it doesn't even have the wiring in, in, with it. You have to buy a kit um, with the garbage disposal in order to have this. And so um, what a lot of times people will do was they'll, they'll come in and they'll replace the water, the, the garbage disposal with the same type of garbage disposal that they already um, had. And then they'll just take the wire and kind of shove it in there and twist the wires together and then call it good. But the problem with that is that wire can easily be pulled out and then you have uh, live wires coming out of the bottom of your uh, garbage disposal, which can then contact the base of the garbage disposal and then cause an electrocution risk. Um, in a lot of older homes, um, garbage disposal plugs are not GFCI protected. And so um, GFCI protection is the only way that you're going to be protected from a ground fault. Um, normal uh, circuit breakers are only going to protect for overcurrent. And if anybody has any questions about GFCI, I'm more than happy to delve into that also. Um, and then with cabinetry and all that, I mean, it's just wear and, and you know, improperly operating drawers and doors and hinges and things of that nature, caulking that's needed and crack grout and things of that nature. Um, bathrooms, I mean, we, we dig into a lot of the same thing. We check the operation of, uh, you know, diverters, um, showers and tub, tub units. Um, you know, we check for the operation of the, um, the drawers. Um, we check for operation of the stoppers. Um, you know, general sink operation, we check for any evidence of any leaks. Um, you know, we check for uh, leaks, especially on, um, and our pest inspectors do this as well. Um, even if the house is a slab foundation, um, it's important to check to make sure that the um, shower pan of a, of a tile type shower pan isn't compromised. And what we do is we'll, um, what's called a flood test, and we'll put about an inch of water into the, the pan of a, um, of a shower stall. Um, and let it just sit there. And then if the water starts to seep out of the sides, then obviously that means you have a failed, uh, failed uh, pan on your, um, on your shower stall. Um, and then in the case of a raised foundation home, there's usually a, a pretty good amount of evidence underneath to show that the pan has failed because there'll be a lot of fungus growth and water damage um, to the wood members underneath the shower pan. We mentioned about bathroom ventilation as well. While you're looking at, you know, scrolling through it, let me ask you a question. Um, do you, how do you feel? Do you recommend, should a real estate agent, let's say I'm the listing agent and I'm getting an inspection in advance, 
is it a good idea for me to be there? Do you want the agent there? Do you want the homeowner there? Or if it's a buyer, I know that not that there's a mixed feelings about that sometimes. Um, so that they could, you could talk to them directly or how do you feel about that? You know, so we, we encourage walkthroughs on all of our inspections and I don't care if it's pre-listing, if it's a warranty um, type um, inspection, you know, for, for a brand new home, or if it's, even if it's a brand new home inspection or if it's a buyer's transaction, the reason being is these reports are fine. They're pretty detailed and there's good information here. Um, but um, we, we never we never ask that the seller leave on a pre-listing inspection. And in fact, obviously, if we can we can you know walk through everything through the end, um, it's great. The main thing for us is is we prefer that um, if we're gonna do a walkthrough, we would like it if the um, the buyers, the agents, the the uh, you know the sellers, agents obviously they're gonna always be around, but sellers and, and buyers, the ones that are the most concerned about the items. It, you know, a lot of people will get uh, the idea where they want to follow you around and really kind of dig into what you're doing and ask you questions and all that. And it's really distracting and it makes it really, really difficult to actually do a good thorough inspection when someone's constantly asking questions and following us. Sometimes it's fine and it's, and it's understandable, but especially when it's a seller and we're kind of, let's just be honest, we're tearing apart their house and, and, and looking at everything and critiquing everything that's going on. And most of the time they're just like, no, I, that, I just did that. I just fixed that. And so um, we definitely encourage a, a walkthrough with all of our clients because we really want to get a chance to explain the things that we found and then um, you know also have that communication. It's it's looking at a report is not you know some some, some um, agents prefer it because they don't want the the inspector to scare their clients. But um, our inspectors, um, you know, with our company personally, um, you know, we they're trained to, to to you know to give this information in a as biased a way as possible, but also not to scare them. Um, we don't talk about every single thing that we find in our inspections because the, again, that's what the report's for. We usually like to cover the more important items and really especially, and we, and we try to tailor our walkthroughs based upon who we're talking to. So if we're talking to an agent and all they really care about is the big stuff, we'll do that. If it's a first time home buyer, we really try to make sure we go in there and we talk about all of the shutoffs and we, we really try to dig into the you know, the, the, the maintenance items and things that they have no idea about because they've never owned a home before. And so we'll take the time to do that. But um, we absolutely do encourage um, clients to be there um, at the end, especially um, so that we can talk about all the items that, uh, that, we, that, we, that we found. What's your turnaround time right now if somebody had an inspection? They, they, so that if they need an inspection, um, an inspection completed? Right. So if I called you today and say, hey, I need a I need a property inspected. Um, so I, you know, how many days should I allow typically in the contract to get the inspection, the report and everything back? So typically we are about um, in the Bay Area, we are about a week out right now um, just because of the, 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 the large um, need of inspections currently. Um, we are we are, um, you know, training new inspectors and we also have inspectors in the Sacramento area that we'll send down. So to handle some of the capacity needs, but um, where we're going to be eventually is uh, 48 hours maximum um, as far as timeline. But right right about now, we're about a, a week or so out um, as far as getting an inspection schedule. Um, most of the inspections um, that we do, uh, we'll have the report out the same day um, in the uh, in the Bay Area. But our our um, our actual company guideline is that we have them out by the next business day by 5 p.m. But most of the inspectors down there will get the inspections done. Um, during the same day and have the reports out that same day. All right, great. One thing, I hope you don't mind me just, you know, throwing out questions along the way. But one of the things you mentioned that that resonates with me is for uh, if let's say one of the agents has a buyer buying a new home. Like I always, when I'm representing somebody, or I'm not representing them, but I have a client buying a new home, I recommend that they get a property inspection. Um, you do inspections of new homes. Is that something you'd recommend that people do? Absolutely. Um, the reason being is because um, everybody is, is human, obviously, and to have another set of eyes, trained set of eyes on the home is definitely important. Um, one of the things that we found, and, and, and I've personally done multiple brand new home inspections where there, there's never a time when I've never found anything. And usually when I find something, it's pretty severe and it's something that needs to be taken care of. Now, that being said, for the most part, 
they're, they'll be taken care of. The, 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 the builder will usually take care of these items. Um, you know, but I find I found uh, water leaks. I found problems with the air conditioning system. There, some of these um, trades they come in so quickly and rush to get it done, and no one's going to come in and fully test all of these items. They just have a, an, an inspector that they have coming in, and they're just you know kind of doing spot checks, mostly for cosmetic things. Um, so the, the 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 transaction is is or, or the 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 work is done so quickly, and they have all these trades running and doing so many different things that there's a lot of things that do sometimes get missed. They do have a pretty decent, um, you know, checks and balances system, but there's still things that get left. And so um, if there's somebody that's having an off day or you got an apprentice or something that maybe is doing the work, sometimes things get uh, get left. And, and uh, that's why I absolutely recommend even having them on new homes. And even on the, um, the 11 month warranties, well, you know, their warranty, their, their year long warranty is about to expire and they'll get their inspection done, you know, at the 11th month. Um, when we do those, we typically find things too. And that's a good time for, for homeowners to then mention it to their builders. But the problem is, is that at that point, it's, it's usually way better to get this stuff done before the house is actually released to them because then they're much more inclined to do it immediately where when you do the 11th month inspections, sometimes they kind of, you know, drag their feet and they take a little bit longer to get things done. But um, I absolutely recommend a brand new home inspection, 100%. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then the, another thing, so we're getting into this section in the interior. Try to try to, um, to not take the previous repairs note or further evaluations recommended note lightly. Um, we, we mentioned a lot of times in our inspections to inquire with the seller to gain knowledge about something. So for example, if there's a previous repair somewhere, um, the, a lot of times if it's not obviously leaking or wet or, or stained, we don't know why they repaired it and they, we don't know what the situation was. But if we see anything that looks like there's something that's been repaired there or it doesn't look like it originally was, we'll make, we'll make mention of that and then we'll suggest to inquire with the seller. So if it's a buyer's transaction, it's always good to inquire with the seller and ask questions. I know that um, the disclosures lately, I feel like none of them have been available during our inspections. And so the, the agents and, and, home, and, and buyers don't really have any idea because these transactions are so quick right now that they actually don't have any idea, you know, if something was disclosed yet because they haven't gotten the disclosures. But, um, and then sometimes they don't even know to disclose some of these items, you know, and sometimes people just don't disclose things. So um, when something's pointed out by a home inspector, it's, it's definitely important to do the further evaluations. Um, same thing even with the sewer lateral inspection. We've had sewer lateral inspections done where we make mention of items that are gonna need to be um, looked at in the future. The future can be a couple of months, it can be a year, but things need to be, like all of these notes that we put in these inspections, they need to be looked into properly. Um, and you can't really downplay anything um, if we make mention of it, it's, it's definitely important. The reason why we're putting those notes in there is because there will be, or there has already been a problem. And so it's always important to know what that problem's been and what it is, what it is that you can do to, to, to remedy the issue. There's a question. Do you do inspections for mobile homes? We do. Um, um, any manufactured home or mobile home will do inspections for those. Um, you know, the foundation is uh, very different on those types of homes. Um, there's things that most people don't really know about uh, mobile homes, especially um, needing, uh, needing to have leveling done on a regular basis. Um, when we crawl underneath these things, I mean, it looks like a, a like it kind of did the day that they left it there. You know, there'll be a, a, a tongue from when they had it hooked up to the truck. There'll be an axle. And sometimes, depending on which ones, there'll be wheels under there. But typically, they take all that stuff out. Um, those are usually the older ones. But um, yes, we absolutely do. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention too, as far as roof inspection. So, um, uh, you know, all of our home inspectors are equipped with pole cameras. We don't use drones, um, but we do use pole cameras. The nice thing about the pole camera is even if it's raining, um, we can still get a look at the roof. And then also the um, second story roofs that are, um, you know, a lot, uh, a lot higher and, and, and inaccessible by most home, normal home inspectors. Um, we'll be able to inspect those with our pole camera. And by the way, just so you kind of get an idea, if you're thinking, well, what does that look like? These pictures were taken from this report. These pictures were taken with a pole camera. These pictures here, these were all taken with a pole camera.
and then the the height of this roof these would have not been items that would have been able to have been inspected by um you know any normal means from the ground with binoculars or anything like that Oh, so for laundry, um, you know, I actually have, I actually have a, a sheet that I wanted to, to show, but laundry, laundry vents, dry vents should, should always be inspected. Um, let me, uh, let me pull up um, something, see if I can find it. Ah, uh, here we go. This is a yep. little, this is a little off, uh, kind of off the topic. Can you see this okay? Yes, looks good. Okay. So this is a presentation that I like to do, um, but this is, this is basically from, you know, from a, uh, from a home inspection report. I did this presentation when we were kind of still in offices, but um, the idea behind this is this basically talks about common, um, you know, common finds on home inspection reports and things that are, that are missed often. Um, you know, so uh, again, with roofs, gutters are very oftentimes neglected. And then when the gutters are neglected, it can typically lead to these kind of areas here. Your gutters leaking and it's got, um, you know, uh, um, damaged um, seams. It can cause a lot of different dry rot to your wood members. And again, this can be very, very costly. So deferred maintenance is probably one of the biggest things that is the cause for some of these expensive uh, costs over time. Um, so it's definitely important to to take care of these things again roof roof items valleys on roofs tile roofs there's no way for you to properly clean the valley without removing the tiles this isn't like a composition shingle roof you literally have to lift the tiles like 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 they are in this picture down here on the bottom and then remove the debris from the actual valley and that's literally what can be in those valleys that is unseen until you remove those tiles this is typically what it looks like um, this is typically what it looks like from the surface, um, and that's if you're lucky. And then if somebody doesn't blow it off, that's what it looks like underneath all of that there. And then same thing with roofs. This is this is something that needs to be done probably every um, you know 10 to 15 years or so. This is a rubber um, storm collar that seals the the pipe that penetrates the roof. These things crack and um, and um, um, have damage all the time, and this is a, a, a often source of water intrusion into the home from a roof. And then, obviously, just worn worn members on the outside of the house um, needs to be need to be painted. Anytime you're keeping your paint, um, again, the deferred maintenance, not not keeping your your wood members painted, is going to allow for uh, dry rot and water damage. And then again, you get a home that you're just about to um, put on the market and you put a bunch of bark out front because it looks great. But then this is the kind of thing that can happen if you have um, if you have bark or, or other landscaping materials right up against the side of your home um, underneath the uh, between the foundation and the bottom of the stucco um, uh, frame at the bottom. This is an often um, area where, where uh, water intrusion will occur and also it's a direct path for wood destroying uh, insects. And then crawl spaces and basements, they're oftentimes neglected. Nobody goes down there. Um, a, a termite inspection, if you have a um, crawl space, those should be done at least um, you know, once every year or two um, just to check. I mean, termites, termites uh, infestations can occur on a very short amount of time. And um, there's no way to know what's going on unless you have this inspected by a, uh, uh, a termite inspector or a home inspector that will go underneath your home. Now, of course, Anyone can go underneath their home and take a look at most people don't want to. So these are items that should definitely be looked at. Um, Ductwork underneath homes. And again, in the attic space, if you ever have an opportunity where rodents or uh, other animals can enter your home, whether or not they're in the crawl space or in the attic space, um, ductwork damage can occur from um, rats and, and uh, other animals chewing through them or just um, over time deterioration. Um, the steel on the tape sometimes will fail and then the ducts will fall apart. And then all, for all this time, you knew your, your ductwork's been blowing uh, conditioned air into your attic or your crawl space. And so, again, um, this is the kind of thing that should be looked at on a regular basis. Leaky pipes, um, same situation. 
Um, this just occurs over time. It doesn't have to be anybody that bumped into your pipe or anything like that. Um, sometimes pipe will, pipes will crack just from the, the change in heat um, and cool. If you have water running through the pipe, sometimes pipes will just crack just because of that. And um, so it's definitely important to um, identify that um, ahead of time. So that way there's no um, damage uh, that's going to occur. Um, again, same thing um, with underneath the house. There's If there's leaks that are minor leaks at the surface that look like they're fine, may be causing major damage underneath the home. And so this can be a very costly um, expense if this isn't checked into on a regular basis. And then of course, obviously termites, that goes into the same uh, point about that as well. Um, if you don't have someone checking on, on this on a regular basis, you may um, end up having problems that are very costly later. And again, you know, you have a, a pre-listing inspection that's done to determine some of these items. Um, these are a lot of the things that are found because no one, um, a lot of deferred maintenance and a lot of um, um, things haven't been checked on. Maybe the home hasn't been sold in 10 or 15 years and no one's done any inspections. This is the kind of thing that can occur. Dryer Good vents are, are so neglected. This is this is what some of them can look like. And I mean, when I say that they're clogged, I mean, this is, it's again, this is almost like a clogged artery, same thing. Um, this is a pretty big uh, cause of home fires, um, and these things should be cleaned out at least every couple of years. What is and the best thing. way, excuse me, I'm sorry, to, but um, so many of these things could lead to costly repairs, costly work. What, other than having a contractor that they know, is there a way, is there any other way to find out getting estimates? You guys don't do that. Do you? I mean, you don't give a, a range of what it might cost or that's the most common question I get from agents is, all right, so there's this problem. How much is it going to cost? Um, well, and so, you know, sometimes if we're depending on the home inspector that you get, I mean, most of our home inspectors have some kind of a construction background for the most part, but most of the time we can give a, a, a rough estimate of what it might cost. I mean, I know when I do my inspections, I like to do that because when you're giving bad information or when you're giving alarming information, you want to at least give an idea about what it's going to cost so that it's a little bit more of a, uh, an easier blow. But um, so for our termite inspections, we do quote uh, most, if not all items. Um, home inspector items, I mean, typically um, it's, it's good to have a, um, you know, a, a portfolio of uh, contractors and, um, and other uh, trade and that can give you these, these, these answers. Um, like I said, for the most part, we can offer them um, as rough estimates in some cases, but um, most of the time, once these items are um, are found during the home inspection, it's good to, to lean on some of your um, trusted vendors. Neglected fireplaces, again, are, are very typical items. Again, people just use them. They don't really take care of uh, cleaning them and, and uh, making sure this is a cracked um, um, ceramic surrounds on the inside of a fireplace is uh, pretty dangerous to use. Um, and then obviously a flue that hasn't been cleaned in a pretty extended period of time. Um, HVAC systems, um, again, um, regardless if it's operational or not, we do not have any way of knowing if that heat exchanger has failed. The heat exchanger um, basically has, uh, the way that that works is that the, the, the burned fuel is, is actually, the exhaust is blowing through the heat exchanger and then it's exhausted out through the flue. But if this, if the heat exchanger itself is damaged, then that exhaust, um, those exhaust gases are then um, released into the airstream, which can be the reason why it's unsafe and, and carbon monoxide issues and things that can come up. Um, but there's no way to know um, that there's a failed heat exchanger by us doing a home inspection. Someone needs to come in with a, a camera that they can put into the heat exchanger and actually view to see if there's actually damage. That can be done by a licensed HVAC company. Again, if it's a newer system, it's usually not too big of a deal for us to just come in and do the type of inspection that we do. But if it's a 20, 30 year old unit and they are not looking to try to replace that unit and even though it's operational, it probably would be best to have an HVAC company come by and do a more of an advanced inspection on those types of units. And again, this is the same thing. Uh, without regular maintenance, you have, um, you know, um, condensate that drips into these pans in the attic space. Without regular maintenance, um, this is a common occurrence, and um, you know, a lot of damage can be caused by these uh, these condensate um, lines and systems. 
And then again, uh, our friends, the rodents, uh, crawl spaces and also attics, it's pretty common um, to have um, you know, issues in your attic space. Um, there's small holes, any small openings, uh, a rat or a mouse will, will try to get into those areas and will cause all kinds of damage in your attic. And again, we see this, we're not licensed pest individuals as home inspectors, but obviously if we see evidence of, of, of such, we'll mention it. But um, this rodents in your attic can definitely be a pretty costly um, situation. So, any other questions come through? Uh, would you see? Would you recommend to do an inspection if a seller did an inspection? So the seller's already got an inspection. Would you recommend another inspection? Is I guess the question. You know, it's it's really it's really um, up to the buyer in a situation like that. Um, you know, if you have a good reputable home inspection company that that's done an inspection pre-listing, it's not like the at least. And that's the thing. Some uh, home inspection companies, um, you know, you'll, or, or or like home inspectors, you'll get some um, some um, th some inspectors that are a little bit um, less detailed in their report on a seller's inspection. Um, we don't we don't do we we do our, our our all of our inspections exactly the same. The only thing that we may do on a on a new home is we may nitpick things a little bit more just because there shouldn't be anything wrong in a new home. Um, but I, I still think it's a good idea, but only if you have any reason to not trust the inspection company that did the inspection in the first place, because any inspection company that, that goes through a home and, 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 and digs through everything in the home should be thorough enough that they should be covering all these items. But again, having a second set of eyes, if the buyer is willing to pay for it, I mean, it's, it's definitely a good idea if you're concerned. And that way you just have that much more of a, uh, a look into what's going on in the home. Sure. My, my suggestion often to agents is if there are calls for further inspection, like the electrical panel has been flagged and you ought to have an electrician look at it or a plumber look at that, that rather than getting a second general inspection, it might make more sense to get a contractor to go out and look at the things that have been called out for a contractor to look at. Because the exactly. next inspector might say exactly the same thing. And then, exactly. And you still and yeah, and instead of spending the money on getting another home inspection, it might be better to spend the money on getting those trades to come out and further evaluate. For example, an HVAC system that's older, maybe they want to look into it a little bit more instead of just, you know, hoping that it doesn't go out, you know. Uh, or like you said, uh, maybe there's an electrical problem that they want to have an electrician come out and say, look at. Yeah, and then we have a question about foundation issues. I don't know if you had a chance, you know, so there's a crack in the foundation. I've heard that, what is it? Uh, Vertical cracks aren't as bad as horizontal cracks and that sort of thing. You know, can you speak a little bit about common foundation issues? Well, and it really just depends on it really just depends on how large the crack is and and, and if there's been any movement. So um, typically, what we look for if there's any kind of found, foundation cracking um, is we look for again how large the crack is, if there's been recent movement, if it's caused any damage to the interior structure, and if there's something that's causing the crack to occur. So if it's just settling, or maybe there's a little bit of movement from when they poured the foundation, um, those are pretty typical. But for example, if you have a large root that's growing underneath the foundation that's causing this to happen, that's more of a concern because that's going to continue to be an issue. It's going to get it's going to get worse in the future. Um, obviously, if the home is a little bit older um, and there's some pretty um, pretty decent settling, um, the item may be a little bit more severe, and we'll call that out as more of a concern. Um, if the house is only like maybe 10 years old and there's some severe foundation cracks, then that's more of a concern because then there's a lot more movement and there will probably continue to be. So we take it as a case by case basis and we really look into a lot of different things to, to find out if the cracks are causing more of a, of a, of a concern. Um, but typically, if it's just small cracks in the foundation, it's not a problem, but it really just depends on how severe they are and, and what other problems that the, that the cracks are starting to cause. All right, cool. Uh, oh, one more question. Is there a guarantee from a home inspection report? Um, if the report does not show the problem, but found later before the transaction closes, how do we fix it? Before the transaction? Well, regardless of before the transaction or, or after. So um, all of our inspections um, come with a money back guarantee. So obviously, if there's some concern where something was missed by a home inspector or 
if um, the customer is just not satisfied with our inspection, um, within reason, um, we will refund the inspection of the, of the, the cost of the inspection. Um, if it's something that um, we can take care of and it's something that we clearly missed, um, in, most, in, in most cases, we will, we will do our best to take care of it and remedy those problems. Um, but um, at, the, at the maximum, typically, we will refund the inspection fee if there is a, a problem. Um, we, we do our best to make sure that we cover all concerns um, and we'll consider anything, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not trying to, you know, to rip anybody off or anything like that. But obviously, like I said, if there's any concerns that come up, we will definitely do our best to take care of those issues. And, and then we have the question that I sort of hinted at. The question is, which is more problematic, the vertical or horizontal foundation cracks? Um, what I've noticed more is the vertical foundation cracks that are that are accompanied by um, other obstructions that are causing them. Um, horizontal foundation cracks, if they're large foundation cracks um, that, that span the entire foundation, then those can be very concerning um, because typically then that means the way that there's that, that that means there's either bowing or it also depends on how the, the foundation was installed. It could have caused a problem when they installed the foundation or there's bowing causing the, the horizontal cracks to occur. But um, as I said, we take every crack specific to what the problem is and what's causing it. And we try to um, identify the concerns as much as possible with, you know, if there's if there's an issue. But um, it really just depends on what's causing the crack and, and, and to, as to what's more severe. Cool. All right, well, thank you. I think we've reached the um, the appointed hour. I really appreciate you taking the time to share and any of you agents out there that have um, the need of a, of a property inspection, please reach out to Charles Kelsey. I, I pasted the link in um, so that you can get more information. I think there's a little bit of a discount going on right now. And um, if that's all we've got, then I want to thank Charles again. They're, they're, you can't see them, but they're standing and applauding, all right? Because that's what they, they usually do at the end of one of these things. All right. And well, then, thank you very much. And Good. then if anybody if anybody ends up having any questions about um, you know any of the any other questions like maybe there are things that were covered or other, other things that come up, feel free to give our office a call. Um, send me an email directly. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. All right. Thanks a lot. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.